Hi, thanks for joining me. In today's episode, we're going to have an introduction to the fine liner, and we'll be discussing what kinds of pens are best to buy, and how to create different tones and textures with the fine liner. To start with, I'd like to look at one of my artworks from about 10 years or so ago of Miss Marple's Tea Room. So stay tuned for that after the intro. <laughs> So here is my drawing of Miss Marple's Tea Room, which is located in Sassafras in the Dandenong Ranges on the outskirts of Melbourne in Victoria. And it's probably about a 10 to 15 minute drive from my parents' house where I grew up. So it was definitely a regular uh, feature in uh, our outings to drive past and, and see it there and occasionally stop in for scones or a huge ice cream sundae or something. Very popular with tourists and um, you can see why I would want to capture it in fine liner with those Tudor features of the building and all the detail of the ivy and so on. So I'm currently trying to <laughs> sell this original uh, work but uh, yeah, hopefully someone will buy it but this is the kind of thing that I love to do with the fine detail uh, trying to create different textures there's lots of different tones in there as well some of the work might be a bit hard to see is made up of dots and then we've got all kinds of squiggly lines and so on so it's all made up of lines and dots. But anyway, I just thought I'd show you this before we launch into our introduction for fine liners. Just to show you that this is where we can head with fine liner and um, you can really use it for beautiful effects. So in our introduction to using a fine liner, first of all, I'd like to talk about uh, the pens themselves and these are the ones that I use most regularly, the Unipin Fine Line, and it says water and fade proof pigment ink, uh, and this is a point one, and uh, you can see it's got a little window there, that's how I easily recognise them when I'm out and about, uh, and they give a nice warm black, uh, and they also have a range of different ones. I've also got point two here and some other ones. So these ones are great for uh, your fine detailed work. And if you're wanting to produce a picture that will actually last a decent amount of time. So with the point one, yep. a lovely fine line. They're very smooth, easy to use, feels nice to hold. And it's the point two, just slightly thicker. I do have some thicker ones somewhere, but uh, I think they're hiding in a cupboard somewhere at the moment. Uh, and in the past, I've had some other brands. This one's Art Studio. This is a point three. So, as the obviously as the numbers increase, it's going to get thicker. With the point zero five, which is about half of the, or is half of the point one. 
You can see that's it there. It's getting harder to see. Great for really fine details and that is also uh, water resistant um, and it's a water-based pen. I'm not sure if it, that one, that one doesn't say fade proof, although it does say pigment. So the pigment inks are the ones that are going to last longer. But uh, this is the sort of pen that I had when I was in high school, I think probably back in maybe year seven, but definitely year eight for graphics. I think it's that type of pen that we had. This is a 0.4 and yeah, so thicker than all the others, stands out really well. Easy to use, nice and smooth, but it's not water resistant and uh, it's not fade proof. So after a while, especially if your drawing is displayed in, in a sunny room, the black is most likely going to fade to a sort of brownish color, whereas the other ones should keep their black for longer, all being well. And this kind of pen is not the best for using with watercolour, unless you use it after the watercolour is totally dry, but whereas the other ones, they won't bleed as much as, as this one, but this is still a good one for um, dry work. And if you're not planning to do something that needs to last for decades and decades. Um, and I will just mention also that different brands of fine liners can often have a slightly different uh, I guess color or hue to the ink so the ones that I like to use have a warm black like a brownie black others I've used in the past can either have more of a bluish tinge to them or even a reddish or purpley tinge and if you're changing the brand of pen in the middle of an artwork you could get into problems where some of your work looks more bluish and others looks more reddish or brownish so it's good to stay with the same brand even though you might use different thicknesses of pen within that brand for the actual artwork so when we're using a fine liner or any kind of pen compared to using a grey lead pencil or colour pencils or, or even paint, or especially paint and pastels, we are strictly dealing with lines and dots. We're not able to smudge the uh, the pen unless we're using some a water-based one that can bleed out if we want to add a bit of water to it or we're using uh, some kind of alcohol um, solution to maybe try and spread the ink out. Some people might like to get those effects with their pens, but generally if we're just doing a simple drawing without water involved, we're just dealing with lines. And so you might think, well, how do we create um, different shades just using lines and dots? So it's dots and lines. And as I tell my students, a line is a dot that's traveled on the journey. So basically, the further apart the lines are, the lighter the tone's going to look. But the closer together the lines get, the darker the tone is going to look. It's always a temptation or a, just a habit when I'm demonstrating this for the lines to get somehow shorter and shorter as well. And I don't know why that is, but even my students found they were doing that as well, so interesting. All right, so you can see now that the tone is starting to look darker and darker. I can't get much closer than that without making, without actually touching it. So you can see that there, that, um, yeah, the further apart we space our lines, the lighter it is going to look. The closer together our lines go, the darker it's going to look. We could do this with dots as well. So the further apart the dots are, the lighter it's going to look. 
notice that I'm not banging my pen up and down as some of my students used to do. And then it's like, oh, Mr. Kingdom, what happened to the nib? It's like, well, you squashed it into the pen. So we just press lightly. And this is the kind of effect you could use if you're shading in a rock or something like that. Some artists you've probably seen will actually do portraits just using dots. I couldn't be bothered myself, it would be a bit tedious. <laughs> but um, they certainly can get amazing results. I think I prefer to have a variety of different marks in my work. Just to vary it up a bit, make it a bit more interesting for myself. Yeah, so the closer together our dots go, the darker it's going to be. And there's also cross hatching. This one's always a bit trickier to demonstrate in the same sort of way. To know exactly where to put your lines. Just going further up and further in, as Narnia says. So closer together our overlapping lines go, the less gaps there are in the middle, the darker it's going to get. So that is basically how we create tone using a fine liner. So if you have a fine liner handy or even just any pen, uh, and you could even do it with a grey lid, have a go, although the dots will be more challenging because you need to sort of press or almost squish the, the grey lid onto the page to, to make a few marks. Uh, but have a go at just trying to create tone in different ways with the fine liner and yeah see if you can get a variety of tones happening to, to finish up i like to spend some time talking about texture and showing you how to create different textures using a fine liner and i'm just using the 0.4 at the moment even though normally i use a 0.1 uh, but for the sake of my view is it's probably easier if I use one that's a bit thicker so that you can see everything clearly. So if I was to draw a couple of rocks, I'll start with sort of a round bumpy rock. I had a few little bumps on it and you can try this while I'm demonstrating or watch and then have a go yourself. You might like to pull up a picture on the internet for each one that you can look at as you go, or just go by what I've been doing. So we want, when we're doing something natural, we want the dots to be a bit random. If you end up with dots that are in line, Kind of like that. They might not always be, but sometimes your dots can be a bit too neat or something, a bit too orderly, then it can look unnatural. So you want to make sure that they're just more sporadic. Some are closer to others, some are a bit further apart, unless you need them all to be the same distance apart from each other for certain surfaces. So as we've already discussed, the closer together our dots are, the darker our tone is going to get. And it's probably the dot process that is the longest of all the different ones for making tone and different textures. It does take a long time, whereas if you're doing lines, squiggles or whatever, uh, you can tend to do those quicker than, than the dots themselves. Occasionally you might want to have one where you move the pen around a little bit to create slightly larger little dots or 
craters or whatever in the rock just to add a bit of variety and interest. So you can see how it's starting to look like the surface of a rock. So texture is one of the elements and principles of art and design. And we're trying to, when we're using paper and a pen or a canvas and a paintbrush, we're trying to create the illusion of different textures. We're trying to make an object look like it feels rough or smooth or furry. bumpy. We can make things look like wood or glass, things that are furry or have scales. And it's up to you the level of detail that you put into creating texture. Comic book artists can create texture quite easily using a minimal amount of marks and lines and dots and things. Uh, but if you're doing, trying to do a more representational artwork, then you're going to end up doing more and more marks on your page. So there's my little rock. I could add even a bit more shading towards the bottom as usually happens. Could also double as a lump of cookie dough. Just needs the chalk chips put in. Cookie dough seems to be the, the hit flavor ever at the moment. See it in everything ice cream and chocolate and who knows what else and then I can just pop in I'll go back to lines pop in a bit of a shadow and then there's usually a really dark shadow underneath objects So there's our rock or lump of cookie dough. And if I wanted to do a different kind of rock, maybe one that was a bit more like, almost like a crystal, you know how crystals can have those uh, flat surfaces on them and they're more geometric, uh, sort of things like this. I'm just inventing my own rock at the moment, so. um, just to make a point. All right, so let's call it a rock or a crystal, whatever. Um, so we've got flat surfaces and instead of doing dots this time, we can do what often you'll have noticed in comic books or in cartoons where they'll use lines like this to show that it's a pane of glass. That's a, such a simple way to just show that a surface is made of glass or it's very smooth and glossy and shiny. So we could do something similar, but I am going to use more lines here. I'll try and put the shadows for different parts in the same spot or same side. Imagining the sun's over here. And we can do some this way, but maybe make them a little bit lighter. So this process, as you can see, is a lot quicker than the last one with the dots. And then I might leave the top bits light 
like that. And then I can just, once again, add in a bit of shadow to make it look like it's sitting on a surface or on the ground or whatever and not floating in the air. And just add in that little shadow underneath as well. Okay, so that's rocks. Now let's think about uh, tree trunks. I'll do a couple of tree trunks and you can have a go at them. You might want to look up some different ones and um, see how you go. Look up photos of actual tree trunks. I'm just doing this from sort of imagination. So here's my first one. And I'm going to do something like a silver birch. I'm not super familiar with them, but I do know that they will have some markings going across. So I'm just doing little lines. I used to love silver birches um, as a kid. My grandparents had one or two in their front yard and I used to enjoy it when the little seed things, I don't know what the technical name for those ones is, um, when they were dried out and you'd go and pick one off and then rub it in your fingers and it would flake everywhere and you'd watch all the little little flakes just float in the air and <laughs> probably create baby silver birches somewhere that my grandparents didn't want them but anyway it was lots of fun and they are quite a distinctive tree trunk and it's probably half the reason why gardeners like to buy them so it's not always just about the leaves of a tree or the flowers and things If I was going to be doing uh, like a, a proper artwork that I wanted to sell, stick in a frame or whatever, uh, I would be working from a photo and not just from my imagination. Um, there's nothing wrong with working from imagination, but for me, if I'm wanting to make something look very much like the actual object in real life, then I will use photos and things. I try where possible to use photos I've taken myself at least for the main scene and so on. Sometimes you might just Google part of a tree or something if you need a bit more detail. And there's not something nearby that you can have a look at. All right, now for shading, I'm going to use diagonal lines here. And I'm going to imagine once again that the sun is over here or the light source. So I'm only going about halfway across. And then I'm going to move across a bit more. And, but I'm not, I'm not going to, so I'm not going to come as far this time. And you can see how it's starting to get more of a 3D look. And then I'll give it one more go, even closer. Sometimes you might miss a line or two that you need to go over and you just go back. So, and you might add in a few little random bits on the sides just to make it look like this. A bit more stuff happening on the surface. So there's my silver birch tree trunk. Now, I think from memory, this is what a pine tree um, tree trunk would look like, but it really doesn't matter what type of tree it is. The main thing is how I'm going to make the marks. So if you've looked at some kinds of tree trunks, they'll be made up, the bark looks like little slightly wobbly or jagged rectangles or strips all join together. So this kind will take a bit longer than than that one. And sometimes there might be a bit more of a dark line coming across here and there. But if you can get into this level of detail, really observing the patterns on different surfaces and materials, 
an object, then this is what's going to bring that realism into your work and take it to the next level. And once I've added in all my little details, I will then add in shading over the top of it. Occasionally there might be a knot or something dark, but just to add a bit more interest. Something I haven't mentioned yet is that you can actually put less pressure on the pen if you want to get a lighter tone. So I'll just show you over here. So this is pressing normally, but I can also just press a bit more lightly. Sometimes you'll miss it and that's fine if you're happy with that. Um, and also if you move more quickly, notice how we do have little white gaps slightly. It's almost, it's more like a scratched line rather than a nice smooth solid line. And that's another way that you can get lighter tones with the fine liner. So either by applying different amounts of pressure and also applying different amounts of speed. So I go slow, I go fast. All right, so I'll leave that one there as far as the texture goes, but now I want to add in shading on the same side. So once again, I'm just doing those diagonal lines. You could do cross hatching. It's up to you how you do your shading. But I like particularly diagonal lines. Sometimes I'll do vertical lines or horizontal, but I like my lines to mostly be in the same direction, particularly when I'm shading. It gives a nice rhythm to the work. And then sort of when you finish it off and you look in at certain parts, it's just nice to have that, uh, that flow in the work rather than it all looking quite haphazard and random, a bit like the old engravings from a couple of centuries ago, which were quite stunning, and it was almost like they were doing calligraphy in picture form. And again, we can add in some extra little bits on the sides to make it look a bit rougher here and there. There, so there's a, a rougher, possibly a pine tree, I'm not sure, but anyway, that's another tree trunk. Now, if we were doing wood, so just planks of wood, um, so there's one plank, I'll just make it a bit more 3D. And these are the kinds of things that I was taught in year eight graphics, and I used to love making textures and adding tone with the fine liner. And I often, I think, sit in church when the sermon was happening and had my bit of paper and a pen and we'd practice making textures on things. And drawing is actually a good thing to do when you're trying to listen to something else as well. It's a bit if you're not having to make too many decisions in the artwork that you're doing, it can actually help you to listen to the speaker a bit more. All right, so there's one. I'll just add in some bits on the side. 
I forgot to tell you what I was doing there, but um, I'm just, often if it's a solid bit of wood, you'll notice that the grain at the end, it's sort of, it's a continuation here, and then it jumps down below. So it might just be a bit there and so on. Um, so this might be like a piece of pine where you've got a knot in it and I've got these sort of loopy bits, like what you see on um, on a, a weather map on the news or something. <laughs> I don't know what they call those things, but anyway. Um, so that was, is that one. And you could add texture over that if you wanted to. I don't really need to, but just to show you, you could add your diagonal lines as well, especially if you need the wood to look darker. And you could make it darker on the sides as well. So that's one kind of wood. Some bits of wood, like a hardwood, they don't necessarily have a wide grain or anything that's really um, noteworthy on them. It's more just they might have a little bit of change in their direction. It might just be something a bit more like that. Okay, so just very quickly adding a little bit of shading there. All right, and I'll just do one more where I will draw some fur. So let me um, just do a quick sketch of a, a bunny rabbit, which would make my nieces very happy. As they have, I don't know how many rabbits they have now, but they have a few. And they've had a bunch of babies that have been sold off. They're very cute. And the ones with the floppy ears. And once again, I'm just doing this from imagination. I'm not looking at a natural rabbit photo at the moment. So I'll just make up what I think he can look like. <laughs> I might give him little teeth. He looks like he's going to smile. Give him a little eye there. There we go. The point is that we want to add in some the illusion of having some fur. So I'll just give him a few little whiskers and I'm moving the pen very quickly. Better give him a bit more of a jaw, otherwise he might be in trouble. Alright, looks like he's ready for a feast of carrots. So let me add in a bit of fur. I think I'll make him standing up and I'll give him a carrot behind his back so he's being a bit naughty. Stolen one out of Mr. McGregor's garden and so just little lines I can put less pressure on in some places. Some animals, as you know, will have longer fur that stands out more. Others have shorter fur, so you can vary the length of your lines. Some will be more wispy and all over the place. Some will be neater. Some big feet. Something weird going on with that foot, but never mind. We are just practicing. And when you're practicing, mistakes, especially, are part of the process. They're annoying if you're doing the actual artwork for someone that's going to pay for one, but uh, yeah, when you're practicing, we don't have to be so precious. Give him a fluffy tail. Off her. And add in a bit of shading. And 
and <laughs> to resist the urge to put another eye there. It's like, no, it wouldn't be seen yet on this side. All right, and in some shading, whoops, a bit dark on his ear. And a few little leaves from the carrot that he's just pulled out. Naughty bunny. Okay, and I'll just pop in shadow. him. Well, it could be a her for all I know. It's not just the male bunnies that steal the carrots, I'm sure. All right, so there is naughty carrot stealing bunny who's looking very happy. All right, so that is just a basic intro to using a fine liner and I hope to do more videos coming up that will explore more of what we can do with fine liners uh, but actually drawing objects from real life or from photos and creating scenes and things like that but that's hopefully enough to get you started uh, so have a go at practicing these different objects you could do a different animal if you don't want to do a bunny uh, and you might want to add in some other objects as well make a few pages of different things uh, try some really challenging things. I tried some jelly, <laughs> drawing jelly with my students the other night and that was pretty challenging for us. So um, yeah, actually this one, if, if I used that technique, it would probably be quite good for jelly. So anyway, have a go. And if there's certain things that you'd like me to cover about using a fine liner over the next number of videos as we focus on this uh, let me know in the comment section and uh, if you enjoy the video please remember to click the like button and if you haven't yet subscribed it would be great if you could subscribe as well and I shall look forward to seeing you in the next videos and not sure if Bunny will be there but uh, I'm sure he'll be around somewhere finding some more vegetables for his stash. So blessings and we will see you in the next video.